online, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. We are here for one purpose, and that is to seek the face of God. And so uh, for those of you in the room, if you would stand, we are going to enter his presence uh, with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And if you're at home and you want to stand, feel free to stand and let us begin to worship God. Lord, we love you. We ask you to come into this place today. We seek your Holy Spirit, Lord, for we are your church. We are those who are called by your name, and we want to know you. We want, Lord, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. We want your healing power in this place. Lord, we want your restoration in this place. We want to walk out of here a church that is empowered to do the work that you have created for us to do. And we give you all the glory and the honor. Receive this praise, Lord. It is for you alone. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
have made that possible by your death and resurrection. You have made the way for us to come and to declare with the angels in the vision of John the Revelator. house today, we willingly cry, holy, holy, holy Lord, on earth as it is in heaven, holy Savior.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revelations 5 says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb. Then I saw a lamb, looking as it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. Can we sing that again and mean it with our hearts and say, Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated and prepare your hearts for communion. We're told to examine our own hearts before taking communion. Who can take communion? Anybody that's a born again believer? We invite you to take communion with you, with us. For you online, if you could run and get a little juice and a piece of bread so you can partake with us. So, as I say comments, you'll have time to do that. For you here in front of you in your pew, there should be some little communion cups. If I could have my wife to bring me one. You'll see that there's two layers to it. The top is the... If you remove the top, it, uh, the ones in front seat, if you reach behind you, there is uh, some in that vacant pew. <clears throat> it has two films. The first film of cellophane exposes the bread, and the second film exposes the juice. Open the bread first so you'll be ready. Here at Bethel and throughout the Christian world, it is taught that the most important event in the world's history is the death of Christ. And the most important future event will be when Christ comes back to this world. And between these two events, Christians must declare Christ's death to the world. Whenever they share the bread and the wine, be it here at church, be it at home and be it at a hospital, or wherever this communion is taken, they are declaring the importance of Christ's death. Christ left us with two ordinances, water baptism and communion. Today we obey with communion. 1 Corinthians 11:26. the Apostle Paul explains in the, and I read from the NIV, for whenever, whenever you take, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we take communion this morning, we look to the past, looking back to Christ's death and resurrection, and we look at the present as we appropriate the benefits of the cross, healing and forgiveness of sins, and we look to the future, we watch and we wait expectantly for the return of Jesus. This is the Christian world view. This is in stark contrast to the world view of the lost 
and the unsaved. So today as we eat and drink, we proclaim the Lord's death. We declare that Christ died for the sins of his people. We proclaim that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified, not in the abstract, but that he actually had his body wounded, bruised, pierced, and broken, and that his actual blood was shed. We, pro we proclaim that he died a real death, that he was buried in the tomb, and that he arose on the third day of his sufferings and death and that he ascended into heaven, and that he right now is interceding for us and for the world, and right now is preparing to return. We proclaim by communion the blessings and the benefits which come by his death. His body was uh, suffered and was beaten for our healing. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin, and for adoption, our adoption into his family. And we proclaim our gratitude by taking communion with a reverent and thankful heart. We, with a, we, with a sense of gratitude and with the declaration of our lips, out loud say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we continue to do this every time we take communion until the trumpet call of that final hour when Christ returns for his church. On that hour, our faith will become sight. Everything we have believed by faith will on that hour become visible to us. What, it will, what will it be like? As the song says, we can only imagine. But I know that it's going to be glorious. And we now, as we wait, say, come, Lord Jesus. Your bride awaits eagerly and expectantly. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? amen. <clears throat> if you will take your bread. And let's give thanks. Dear Lord, I am so grateful for what you did. But because of this bread, Father, my pastor's body was touched and you healed him. Because of the stripes of, of, that, that represents, Father, this bread, my wife, who was pronounced to be dead in nine months, still lives eight, ten years later. I thank you. I thank you for the body, Father. And I thank you for all the healing that has taken place and all the healing that will take place. Thank you, Lord. As we take, we do it with gratitude, and we will remember and never forget. Let us eat. Now, if you'll expose your juice. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. What a sacrifice. What a sacrifice to send your only son to die on the cross to bleed his blood. Father, because you long ago established that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But he only had to die once, and his blood is effective throughout time and to all humanity. And I thank you personally. Thank you, Lord. As we take, we take it with a grateful heart, remembering your sacrifice. Let us drink. I always close communion, taking you back to when you receive Christ. Think on that moment and give him thanks. Thank you. Please. Please take your, your remains of your cups out and there'll be a trash can in the back for you to dispose it.
Good morning. Big smiles. Because of what we just did, we have hope. Christ is alive. And all we did was just remember the hope that we have. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're in the house of the Lord with us this morning. Who felt an earthquake this morning? Anybody? I see Brother Matt. All these people, I didn't feel it. I was pretty close, man. I, maybe something, something's wrong with my house. I, I was hoping to feel it, but everybody's talking about the earthquake this morning. So maybe God's trying to shake us a little bit and get our attention. We're going we're gonna to transition into our giving. Uh, as you know, we, we have an online platform. Uh, to me, a lot of times that's the easiest way. You can go through our website at Bethel Durham and sign up, make it automatic. That way, if you're out of town, you, just, you don't worry about it. It just goes automatically. But I remember one time when uh, Brother James Escamilla was taking up uh, offering, he kind of challenged me. He said, don't let it become so automatic that you don't stop for a minute and think about what you're doing, the seed that you're planting. It shouldn't become so automatic. I mean, it's good that it's automatic in the natural, but we should never forget that, that we're called to give to God and give to his kingdom. And sometimes by having something in our hand to drop into the plate, I've heard Pastor Don say before, and it's kind of true of me, I grew up with the plate being passed, and that's, that's how you always gave. And so it's a little odd for the plate to come by me and not put something in. You know, I'm like, I want to say, wait a minute now, I'm, I'm giving automatically, you know. And, uh, but, but we always want to remember that we are giving to the Lord. And I was thinking it's about priorities. It's about getting our priorities in order. And I was reading this morning uh, in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. And I'm just going to uh, paraphrase it in, in the interest of time. But a rich man came to Jesus. He said, hey, Lord, tell my brother to give me my inheritance. And Jesus asked me, he said, well, I don't have anything to do with this. And, and then he said this to him. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And I think in our culture today, we put a lot of emphasis on stuff. We like our stuff. I like my stuff. But where's your heart? Is your heart in your stuff? Or is your heart for the kingdom of God? And then he goes on to tell a parable. And he says there was a rich man, and he had a lot of stuff. Matter of fact, he had barns full of stuff. And rather than saying, I got a lot of stuff in my barns, and God's blessed me, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I have more than I need, I'm going to start giving my stuff away. Maybe to people who need it, maybe to advance the kingdom of God. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build bigger barns and get more stuff. And then I can just sit back and enjoy life because I got such big barns. I have so much stuff. And Jesus said this to him, and I think it's for all of us today. He said, thou fool, this very hour your life will be demanded from you, for you. Then who's going to have your stuff? Stuff won't mean much to us the moment we step out of it, this earth into eternity. Our stuff is going to mean nothing to us. And so there was three principles I took out of that. Life's not made up of our stuff. The rich fool had enough stuff. I mean, he already had barns, but he wanted bigger barns. How many of you gone shopping for, for a car? So I'm just going to go look. Don't ever do that. When you go look, guess what? How many of you are going to look it and come back with it? And you didn't really need it, but you came back with it. Tammy and I like to go to the parade of homes each year. And you go there, and those homes are nice, and they're big, and they're new, and they smell new, and they got the nice open floor plans and the, and the latest colors. And it, for a moment, because it's part of our, our, our nature, we're like, I need to sell my place and go get me one of these nicer houses. And I come back and realize, this is all I need. This house is, meets my needs. It's all I need. Then who's going to have your stuff when you die? And then Jesus asked this question. He said, so is he who lays up treasure for himself. He makes this statement and is not rich toward God. So the question for me and the question for you is, are you, are you as rich toward God as you are toward yourself? And that's a question for me. It's for us to wrestle with. But you know what? We have a church full of faithful people. Because as I said last uh, week when we took up offering, we have done well here. We've supported our missionaries. We continue to support this church, the ministries of this church, in a time that's been very uncertain. So I'm looking at many people who know what it means to be rich towards God. Our offering plates are outside. If you want to drop it in as you go out, if you're set up automatically, that's great. But I want to challenge you this morning to think about you and your stuff. I have to do that all the time. What God is my stuff in its rightful place. 
and make sure it stays in its rightful place because it's always something pulling. Well, I'd like to have that new truck. I'd like to have that nicer house. And come on back, God, what you've given me is enough. Lord, we thank you. God, I thank you for provision. God, we're, we're blessed in this nation. God, we've walked into a beautiful sanctuary on padded pews and air conditioned. We drove cars here. You've been gracious to our nation and to us as a people. And we thank you for that. And it's okay to enjoy the fruits of our labor. But God, help us to never let our stuff take your place. May we keep those things in their rightful place below you and keep our finances in such a place, Lord, that we can reach out, support your kingdom, support our brothers and sisters in need, particularly as we see times change. And we know you're going to honor us, and we know that you're going to bless us. You're faithful to your people, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Larry. Many years ago, we were at our leadership conference on the West Coast in Los Angeles, really. And uh, West Coast can have earthquakes. They're not baby earthquakes. East Coast earthquakes are baby earthquakes. But my wife and I were on about the 10th floor of the hotel. And uh, that night we had an earthquake. When I say earthquake, we had an earthquake. Carol was telling me about the shower curtains in the bathroom, how they were swaying back and forth. She looked out the window down to the pool, and the water was just going out of the pool. And um, it was an earthquake. People left the hotel, went outside. I slept through it. There are hundreds of preachers there usually and a lot of people there at the convention or the conference. The next morning we were downstairs eating, quite a few preachers, and this preacher came in a little bit late, sat down at the table. He said, I really hate I disturbed you folks in my praying last night. So I can say this morning, I hate I bothered you guys with my prayers this morning. It would be great if they were that powerful. Thank you for coming. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. I, uh, we've got several ministers here, some that can, I mean, just really great preachers in this church service this morning. And there's not a one that is a minister of the gospel that would not enjoy preaching about Gideon. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I will not finish this message. I hope that you have an outline. I really do. We have two tables on each side of the sound booth. If you do not have one, feel free to go back and get you an outline. Uh, I would encourage you to go through this extensively because it is so powerful. I'm talking about the Word of God, how powerful the word of God is and I'll read beginning with several verses of scripture the sixth chapter of the book of Judges then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years interesting and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Verse 3. So it was whenever Israel had sown, and listen to this one, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites of the people of the east, would come up against them. They would encamp against them and destroy the produce, destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel. They wouldn't leave anything. I thought this was so interesting as I read and studied this. 
neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Wow. Both they and their camels. One writer commentary said that this was the first time that camels were ever mentioned to be in battle. Uh, without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, this was an unnamed prophet, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Think about it. And the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree which was at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Aborzite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press. How many of you know you don't press wheat in the wine press? It's out in the open where the wind can blow well the, the chaff and clean out the wheat. But here Gideon was because of the Midianites, because he was afraid, was threshing wheat in the wine press. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty men of valor. <laughs> I love that statement. Listen, we don't need to let Satan identify who we are. Let me say it again. You don't need to let Satan identify who you are. The Lord is with you, you mighty men of valor. Listen to Gideon. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. I want to continue reading, but I want to address this because it really, as I looked at this, I could not help but think of where the church is today. I'd like to say to you that the church, God's church, and God's church is victorious. But I'd like to say today, to you today that the church is living out that life of victory. I don't see it. I see some occasions where it's victorious. And I hear people saying, where are the miracles of the 1940s and the 1950s? I hear older people talking about, where are the miracles? What's happened to America today? Where are the miracles? Look at verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee, or have I not sent thee? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You ever felt like that? The enemy beat you down, the enemy lied to you, and, and all these kind of things going on in your life. And you say, Oh my Lord. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall, say shall, you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Gideon was a judge of Israel. Gideon was a great leader. 
judge, and prophet, whose calling and victory over the Midianites are recounted, as we said here on your notes, in chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8 of Judges. Let's look at the outline, if you will. Follow me. Every Christian will have to fight their own Midianite. We have our enemies. You might say, preacher, I know I have an enemy. I go to work with them every day. I sleep with them. You know, I saw a movie years ago, Sleeping with the Enemy. Let me tell you, your enemy, you don't sleep with your enemy. Your enemy is not your wife, your husband. Your enemy is not the person sitting next to you in church or across the aisle. The Apostle Paul tells us exactly who our enemies and our enemy is. Ephesians 6 and 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, notice, notice if you will, the four things that Paul speaks of writing to the church at Ephesus. First of all, principalities. One of my favorite, I guess he's a commentator, Finnish Dake. Finnish Dake, ever how you want to pronounce his first name. He produced the Dake Bible. Let me, let me tell you what he says about these. You have principalities, you have powers, you have rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Listen to what he says they are. First of all, principalities are chief rulers who derive their power from and execute the will of the chief ruler. Then you have the world, rulers of the darkness of this age. Number three, then you, or, 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 or number four, spiritual wickedness, that of the wicked uh, spirits of Satan in the heavens. That's our enemy. That's who your enemy is. As I said, it's not your 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 brother or your sister or someone in the church or someone that you work with or part of your family, if we're not careful, we get our eyes on what we think or who we think the enemy is, and we certainly need not do that. Many enemies. Notice, first of all, a totally intimidating foe. There were 135 warriors. 135 warriors of the Midianites and the enemy that came up against the nation of Israel. It was not only an intimidating foe, it was an entrenched foe. As I read to your hearing, for seven long years, maybe you've been battling something, something for a long time. Five years, four years, three years, seven years, 20 years. I mean, this enemy was really entrenched. Not only was it an entrenched foe, it was an unsettling foe. The Israelites had to run to the dens and the caves. They had to hide wherever they could. They were afraid. I wonder in our society today, in our culture today, are we hiding from the enemy? Oh, he controls the news. He controls politics. In many churches, he even controls the church. And so we're just going to be quiet. <laughs> I mean, we hear many voices, but do we hear the voice of the church? It's a church willing to say, hey, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be counted. An intimidating flow, an entrenched foe, an unsettling foe, and a consuming foe. They didn't have anything left. They would plant their uh, gardens and their crops, and the enemy would come down and leave them nothing. They came down like locusts. Where's the church's sustenance today? 
Do we have an excess? Do we have an abundance of God's blessing? Has the enemy stolen our joy, our peace, the things that we should possess? Ah, oh, this was a consuming foe. Hang on, I'll get positive after a while. We'll get to the, 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 the good part here. A prayer-inducing foe. And then that's what I hope that the church will learn, is learn, hey, we can pray ourselves out of this situation. It should drive us to prayer. It should drive us to seek the Lord. Oh, God. That's the reason it is so wonderful to come down, whether it's Friday night or Wednesday or, or whether it's Sunday morning or get into our, our prayer closets or, and seek the face of the Lord. Don't drive us to complain and find fault and to weakness and intimidate us. The devil wants to intimidate you. Peter says, our adversary, the devil, Satan, walk about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Roaring. You know how far the roar of a lion will carry? Five miles. Five miles. And the devil is trying to intimidate the church. The devil is trying to strike fear in the church. And all he's doing is roaring. He can do no more than what we let him do. God's given us the power. We need to, somebody says, we're not in a battle. This battle, I know the Bible says this, but I think you've got to write the divided. I, you know, this is, the, this is the Lord's battle. Well, why did he give you armor for if you're not in a battle? We're in a battle, folks. You say, Pastor, I want to know how to win. Well, first of all, we can't be at first like Gideon was. Notice his limitations. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. We are abandoned by God. And then God redu reduced his army from 32,000 to three, the 300. Oh, there's nobody, there's nobody standing with us. The crowd's gone. Oh, the crowd's going over there. This is where the crowd is. God's not necessarily looking for a crowd. He's looking for an obedient church people that will stand and, and fight the battle. Don't be intimidated. You know, if there ever was a person that should have been intimidated, it was David. His own father didn't think he was worthy to even call into the house when the prophet came. He didn't think. And then his brothers, his siblings, what are you doing here? You know, he, he, David could have really been intimidated. And then he goes to fight Goliath, and Saul said, what? <laughs> Saul didn't even believe he could do anything. And then he goes out to the, fight the giant, and the giant makes fun of him. He said, I'll feed your flesh to the bones. Let me tell you something. Don't let the devil intimidate you. Let me say it again. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. Stand. Stand for God. Let's look at some lessons how to defeat the enemy on how to be successful. Number one, and I love, the, the reason I want you to read this story. Read Judges this week. Six. Judges seven. Judges eight. Read those three chapters. The first thing that Gideon did was tear down the altar of Baal. False God. How many of you know it's time for the church to get rid of false gods, idols? Woo! That's good preaching, Brother Don. Amen. It's time for the church to tear it down. I love this. When he tore it down, he used the wood. 
He used the wood, the wood that set on fire to offer sacrifice for God. He tore down the altar of Baal. And then he followed God's plan. If you read uh, chapter 7, verses 2 through 23, doing things God's way. Let's, let's listen. It's important that we do things God's way. Don't listen to the devil. I don't know. You didn't say it. I'm the least of Manasseh. You know, he went to crying and all this stuff. God said, wait a minute. Bow, bow, bow. You mighty man of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's, what, that's how God looks at you. You say, I'm not the preacher. I'm not a spiritual giant. No, but you have the spirit of God. You are anointed. You have the greatest force in the world behind you. The greatest force in the world behind you. David did too. He took that, God took that stone. Zip. He falls down, Goliath did, and David goes and cuts his head off. Listen, follow God's plan. God's plan is a different plan. He had 32,000 soldiers. Yeah, but Midianites had 135,000 soldiers. But we can go out with 32,000. God's going to be with us. Oh, hallelujah. God said, wait a minute. If you go with, with 32,000 soldiers, you're going to think you did it. Now, <laughs> I love what God did to call out the soldiers that he did. It's, it's, I don't have time to go through it, but he did. And God left him with 300 soldiers. Plan. Max, look, Cato, no, 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 no. John Maxwell, get them mixed up. He said, how many of you have been white water rafting? He said, the guy, he better do some planning. If you go white water after it. Because you can flat out hit boulders and rock, turn over, you can lose your life. So it's good to plan. Can you say amen? We had this past Wednesday night, one of our best Wednesday night services in a long time. It was so rich. God moved in such a way. We had some of the greatest testimonies. We had some of the greatest teaching. And we had some of the greatest singing Wednesday night. But my wife told. Somebody said after she finished, why don't you do more preaching? I, I, I kind of felt a little bad about that. But anyway, I, I did like her teaching. She plans. And she planned for Wednesday night. And she had every obstacle that you can think about that she had to overcome. If I'd been doing the planning... I would have quit planning a long time ago. You see, the Bible says a lazy man says there's a lion in the street. I would have had 10 lions in the street before I got up behind the pulpit and talked Wednesday night. She don't pay any attention to lions. She just keeps right on planning. We couldn't find the CD that Felicia was supposed to sing with. She had to call Matt. She had to get this thing, get this done, get that done. Oh, she had the plan. She let nothing stop her from planning. Listen, if you don't plan, you run into problems. Some of you are like Doris Day. Que sala, sala. Whatever will be, will be. That sounds, that, I love Darts Day singing, and I love that song, but it just won't get it when it comes to being obedient to God. It's important to plan. Uh, it has been said, by failing to plan, you plan to fail. Are you listening? It's important to plan. God's plan is different. God's plan is a declared plan. <clears throat> you got to have faith. Listen, you got to have faith. 
<clears throat> when you're going out to fight an enemy that's scattered across the valley and the hills like locusts, you got to have faith when there's 135 soldiers that you got to, you're going to battle and you have 300. You better have faith. But I can see those 300 saying, okay, I got to have some sharp swords. <laughs> I got to have some good shields. Now, Gideon, provide all of this for me now. Swords, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> spears, all this. Gideon said, stand up. He said, here you go. What is this? Listen at me. What is this? It's a picture. I mean, a picture, picture. And a light. I mean, like a candle you, you put in the picture. Yeah. Where's my sword? Uh, we don't have any swords. I mean, you got to have faith to think that the leader, the warrior, this great leader provides you with pictures and lights. What's in the other hand? A trumpet. Do what? You're going to give me a picture, a light, and a trumpet, and you want me to go out there and fight 135,000 soldiers? Are you crazy? I mean, you've got to have faith. God sometimes will challenge us to do the impossible. But when you don't know what to do, take that step of faith. Whoop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't see any way out. I don't hear any victorious whatever. But Lord, I'm going to take a step of faith. You must have faith. There had to be, look at it, a plan that required surrender. Listen at me, required surrender. If you don't surrender, thank you, Brother Denny. You are a great, great servant of the Lord. If you don't surrender, and someone tells you to fight the battle with a trumpet and a, and a pitcher and a light. You see, a lot of us aren't surrendered. We, we know more about all this than God knows. I'm not going to do that. I want the sharpest sword I can have. I want the, the nicest shield I can have. I want a great long spear. How many of you know that? Turn to a friend and wave at him. We used to say hug and shake hands. Now all you can do is, I'll be so glad when this is over, about a third of our, more of our congregation, half of our congregation is not coming to church because of the virus. I'll be glad, how many of you be glad when it's over with? I will. God's plan requires surrender. God's plan requires submission. Now notice, here's the reason for success and I'll end it. There was unity. They listened to the voice of the captain. They listened to their leader. And they obeyed what he said. <clears throat> they obeyed. <clears throat> they followed the example of Gideon. The problem today is nobody wants anybody to tell them what to do. I know just as, mu I, just as much of what to do as you do. We need leaders. We need God-called leaders. We need spirit-led leaders. <clears throat> and we need people to say here I am I'm going to be obedient I'm going to listen to the voice of Gideon because I believe he has a finger on the pulse of what God wants to do and I'm going to be obedient to God 
And I'm not going to be one of those folks that's a know-it-all. I'm willing to obey. First of all, he said, do what I do when I do it. I mean, God wants to do something in the church, and this was pulling that way. This is pulling the, the other way. I read the day yesterday where this church almost split over the overhead projector. They'd been sending out their information and their advertisements on bulletin. And then they got this overhead projector, and they advertised. Some liked the overhead projector, and some didn't like it. And the church came that close to splitting. I mean, we can't get along in the church. We need unity in the church. Amen? Let me say it again. We need unity in the church. Oh, God, we need unity in the church. Blow the trumpet. And he said, blow it loud. As you get older, you don't like loud things. I don't like loud mufflers. I used to have what we call back then, Brother Mars, glass pack. I don't know if you've glass packed. I just love to have them. Junius and I, we'd get this old 57 Chevrolet and we'd put as loud a muffler on as you could get. But I don't like loud mufflers today because I'm old. You, you, as you get older, things change. But you kids, you young people, have as loud a muffler as you want. I used to like loud music. I don't like loud music anymore. I went to one church service over in Raleigh, and the main preacher was just great, but the music was so loud, I got him left. Now, I wouldn't have done that when I was younger. But the Bible says here that he told them to blow the trumpet. You can't get a much louder instrument than a trumpet. And he said, blow it loudly. There are times to be quiet, and then there's times to holler and scream and shout, shout, shout. One guy was so excited about serving the Lord, he goes down to the altar, and he started praying and crying out to God, oh, God. Boy, he was screaming to the top of his voice. This guy next to him, it was bothering him. So he reaches over and said, sir, yes. God's not deaf. He said, no, but he's not nervous neither. He just went to crying out and calling out to God. He said, blow the trumpet louder, loud. Then he said, break your pictures where the light was in. Now, if you, if you study this, there was a certain time of night or morning when this took place. Now, here are these 135 soldiers. They've been to sleep. No, they've had people watching out for them. But most of them's been asleep and they're rubbing their eyes. And, oh, you know, it's sort of dark a little bit, you know. Can you imagine? Listen, just think about this. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, they're sleepy, and, and all of a sudden, there's 300 trumpets blasting out. Wow! And all of a sudden they break those pictures and that light breaks forth. Can you imagine if the church would get on fire for God? Hallelujah! Get a hold of a trumpet or something. Lift their voices and start calling and crying out to God and say, God, I want to see you save my children. I want to see you save my loved ones. I want to see a revival take place. Cry out to God. It scared those Midianites to death. Light, I mean, it's about dark and lost. All of a sudden, light breaks forth. Light breaks forth. Hold your lamp high. Listen to this. Break the pictures. This is second. I love this. We need some brokenness, folks. How long has it been since we wept before God? How long has it been since our hearts have been broken for the immorality and the sin that's in the world today? Listen to what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. 
but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. How important it is for us to realize we're just a vessel. I've seen over the years, and I hate to say this, but it's so true. Preachers that take this power, or this anointing, and use it to glorify themselves. Self-interest. I've seen it on and on and on again. I've been in services where the power of God would begin to move. We said, oh, there's going to be great transformation of souls. And then they'd have some of them get up and take an hour to take up an offering. Building their own kingdoms. We need to realize this is an earthly vessel. Lord, use me, but I, I have nothing. Let me say it again. Paul said to the church at Corinth, but we have this treasure. What treasure? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. We have this treasure in an earthly vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Oh God, we need this today. Notice what the psalmist says. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. We need some brokenness. One more. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. We will allow haughtiness, pride to take the place of humility and contriteness. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Broke the pictures. Then hold your lamp high. Philippians 2, 15 and 16. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse. Are we there? In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine. As lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day, Paul says, of this church at Philippi, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Break that picture. Break, break yourself. Brother Matt, would you come? Would you folks come? And then here's what they were to say. I love this. Proclaim the sword of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Oh boy, I forgot Hebrews 4, 4 12. And then the last point I want to make, look on your notes. There was unity, there was obedience, and then there was faithfulness. Every man stood in his own place. Can you imagine what would happen If every man and every woman stood in his or her place, they broke up in 100 companies or three 100 companies, 100 here, 100 here, and then 100 there. And each man stood in his own place. God's looking for some people that will stand in their own place. A man or woman that will stand in the gap and hold up their heads. We need them. Pray with me. Father, we love you tonight, today. We thank you for your bountiful blessings. 
Lord, I thank you so much for this great example of Gideon, the judge, of Gideon, the military leader, of Gideon, the prophet. I thank you for the principles, oh God, that you've given us today and shown to us today. God, I pray against the enemy that's trying to intimidate the church. Lord, he's a liar and the father of lies. I pray against the enemy that has tried to steal the joy, that's tried to steal the peace of the church. I pray against the enemy of our families, our homes, I pray against the enemy of our churches today. And I pray, God, that our churches would become powerhouses <laughs> for the kingdom of God. Glory be to God. Sing for us, Brother Matt.
let the devil speak concerning your identity. Let God speak. You're a mighty warrior, mighty man, mighty woman of God today. Don't you listen to the devil. He's a liar. And he'll sit right here and he'll say all kind of things. You may be facing something next week. You may be facing something next week. But God knows what you're faced with. And he will intervene in your behalf. Hallelujah. I just believe that there is such an anointing in this place today. Hallelujah. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, go ahead and begin to speak in tongues as we worship. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, begin to believe God. Begin to pray. Begin to praise. Begin to accept. Begin to step forth. And it takes faith. It takes faith. Receive from the Lord. Receive from the Lord. Right now. There's someone here you've not been baptized. If you will begin to pray. We'll sing this song again. If you will begin to pray. And if you will begin to praise. Be obedient to God. Be open. Don't let the devil intimidate you. Get rid of that pride that says, I'm not going to cry out to God. We need a church that's willing to cry out to God. <laughs> if my people, what is it? Which are called by my name, shall do what? Humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face. Seek God, give us some men and women. That will seek. Lord Oh, hallelujah. Seek the face of God. He says, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Sing it, Brother Man. faithful. Listen, I was raised in old time fashion Pentecost. There were some things that went on that I'm not too sure was quite kosher, but the power of God was there. We acted funny. We danced before the Lord. He said, I don't believe in all that emotionalism. Well, they were so emotional on the day of Pentecost that all those people gathered there thought they were drunk. 
How long has it been since God moved on you and people thought you were drunk? Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about doing stuff that's crazy. I'm just talking about following the Lord and be open to the Lord to touch your life. Amen. The world can act any way they want to, and it's okay. I mean, if cheering for their favorite team and they jump up and down and carry all kinds, I've seen them dress up and carry all kinds of things, and they can holler and they can do the wave and all, but let the church get a little bit emotional and they say that's taboo. Let me tell you something the church needs to operate in the Spirit of God. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Brother Don, I understand if they're speaking in tongues in church, it's supposed to be interpreted. You need to understand the whole thing. Yes, Paul laid down some guidelines for speaking in public. And most of the time it's in private. I know that. But there are times, folks, we need the operation of the Spirit of the Lord. And we need to speak in tongues. I mean, I don't hang my hat on that. I'm not saying we speak in tongues. But I am saying it's important that we obey the Lord. They use the scriptures. Well, Paul said, I'd rather speak, what is it, one word in English than 10,000 words in tongues? Well, in that same chapter, he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. He wasn't shy when it came to speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you today. Reach out and touch the Lord as he Let's take about 15, 20 seconds. Just wait before the Lord. Hallelujah. We have an enemy out there, folks, and we need the power of God and the Spirit of God manifested, moving, operating in our lives today. Anybody have a word? Father, we love you today, and we thank you for this privilege that we've had to sense your presence. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Thank you for people that love you. Everyone that came today, God, enrich their lives with your holy word. Enrich their lives with your holy presence. Meet their needs. Bless their families. And may they walk, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, obedient to you as we go from this place today. And everybody says... God bless you.